Good afternoon. My name is Cheryl, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Nutanix First Quarter Fiscal 2019 Earnings Conference Call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. Thank you. Tanya Chin, Vice President of Investor Relations and Corporate Communications, you may begin your conference. Thank you. Welcome to today's conference call to discuss the results of our first quarter of fiscal 2019 live from London. This call is also being broadcast over the web and can be accessed in the Investor Relations section of the Nutanix website. Joining me today are Deers Pandey, Nutanix's CEO, and Dustin Williams, Nutanix's CFO. After the market closed today, Nutanix issued a press release announcing the financial results for its fifth quor first quarter of fiscal 2019. If you'd like a copy of the release, you can find it in the press releases section of the company's website. We'd like to remind you that during today's call, management will make forward-looking statements within the meaning of the safe harbor provision of federal securities laws regarding the company's anticipated future revenue, billing, gross margin, operating expenses, net loss, loss per share, free cash flow, business plans and objectives, product sales, plans and timing for, and the impact of our transition to focus more on software-only sales and our tra transition to subscription-based business model, expectations regarding products, services, product features, and technology that are under development or re were recently acquired, competitive and industry dynamics, expectations regarding increasing software sales, our plans regarding how we will report the software content and subscription portion of our business, potential market opportunities, and other financial business-related information. These forward-looking statements involve a number of risks and uncertainties, some of which are beyond our control, which could cause actual results to differ materially and adversely from those anticipated by these statements. These forward-looking statements apply as of today, and you should not rely on them as representing our views in the future. We undertake no obligation to update these statements after this call. For a more detailed description of these risks and uncertainties, please refer to our Form 10-K for the fiscal 2018 filed with the SEC on September 24, 2018, as well as our earnings release posted a few minutes ago to our website. Copies of these documents may be obtained from the SEC or by visiting the IR section of our website. Also please note that otherwise, unless otherwise specifically referenced, all financial measures we use this in the call today are expressed on a non cap basis and have been adjusted to exclude certain charges. We've provided reconciliations to these non-GAAP financial measures to the GAAP measures in our investor relations section of our website and in our earnings press release. Lastly, Nutanix will be at the Wells Fargo Tech Summit in Deer Valley on December 4th, the Raymond James Conference also on December 4th in New York City, the Barclays TMT Conference in San Francisco on December 6th, and the Needham Technology Conference in New York City on January 15th, and we hope to see many of you there. Please mark your calendars for the Nutanix Investor Day in New York City on Wednesday, March 20th. Now I'll turn the call over to Deerich. Deerich? Thank you, Tanya. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to be joining you today from London, where we're hosting our third .next Europe, Middle East, and Africa user conference this week. We're excited to share our latest updates with more than 3,500 customers, partners, and prospects we expect at the show. Those attendees will get to see firsthand as we announce the general availability of Xi Leap here at .next. Leap is a disaster recovery of the service offering I've mentioned to you in the past. This launch is a watershed moment for our company, delivering our services across the entire customer journey from infrastructure modernization to the multi-cloud, which I'll provide more detail on shortly. Now on to our Q1 results. We had a great start to fiscal 2019, delivering another strong quarter, growing software and support billings by 50% year-over-year to 351 million, 
dollars and saw foreign support revenue by 44 percent to 281 million dollars. Notably, subscription revenue increased 104 percent year over year as we shift our business to an increasingly subscription-based consumption. The combination of higher than guided revenue, better gross margins, and lower operating expenses drove our net loss per share to 13 cents per share, significantly better than our guide guidance of a loss between 26 and 28 cents. Dustin will share more on our financial metrics and outlook later in the call. As we head into dot next, <coughs> I found myself taking a step back to reflect on how far we have come as a company since we were founded nine years ago. In less than 10 years, we have done nearly $4 billion in lifetime sales, transformed from a hardware to a software business model while being publicly traded, surpassed $1 billion in annual software and support revenue run rate, and surpassed the 10,000 customer mark while keeping our net promoter score above 90. In this quarter alone, we closed 63 deals worth more than $1 million and three deals worth more than $5 million. And we now have 15 customers who have lifetime spend of more than 15 million and more than 700 customers with a lifetime spend of more than $1 million. In fact, when we look at our customer base, we have seen 83% year-over-year growth in customers with a lifetime spend of three to $5 million and 111% year-over-year growth in customers with a lifetime spend of more than $5 million. To put our achievements into context, we reached a billion dollars in annual revenue faster than any other software company founded in the past 20 years. Salesforce, Palo Alto, Workday included. This success was built on the foundation of strong products and amazing customer service that has propelled us from creating hyper-converged industry to our sustained leadership position within it. Just this past quarter, we were recognized as a leader in the Forrester wave for HCI and by Gartner for our 10-point lead in market share versus the nearest competitor in their most recently reported quarter. From everything I mentioned above, you might think that we are a very optimistic company. On the contrary, we are an intrinsically paranoid com company that happens to be optimistic. In my favorite book, uh, Only the Paranoid Survive, Andy Grove talks about this paradox in chapters seven and eight. Let chaos reign, reign with a G, and reign in chaos without a G. Building is inherently chaotic, and you saw a bit of this in the last 12 months of our new product development and complementary acquisitions. These announcements created confusion in the minds of many who aren't simultaneously balancing building and scaling in their day-to-day. -day. Questions such as, what is the core of your business? Will you need more than your core to get to your stated goal of $3 billion in FY21? Are the new applications even remotely related to the core? Or will they leverage the existing core? Such questions emerged. In this earnings call, I'd like to rein in some of that messaging chaos with a customer journey that will traverse Nutanix core essentials and enterprise. The core of Nutanix's business is infrastructure. We call it the Nutanix core with a capital C. It's comprised of our software-defined storage stack, AOS, an infrastructure control plane, PRISM, and increasingly, but optional for the initial leg of a customer's journey, our hypervisor, AHV. People say infrastructure is a commodity as it becomes good enough, and all the value will move higher up. They're so mistaken. They don't know how hard infrastructure is to execute and make a reliable business out of. There's a reason why hardware incumbents struggle to monetize OpenStack in response to Amazon. Ask Oracle, and they'll tell you about all the pains of building an IL stack. Look at how Azure Stack has been a non-starter for Microsoft as Azure continues to bleed in multiple infrastructure stacks for their various workloads. Google itself has been trying to make their own homegrown core become useful for enterprises, and they've been trying since 2012. Observe how VMware is hedging its best bets between three infrastructure worlds, their traditional three-tier comfort zone, their software-defined struggle zone, and the new AWS cannibal zone. Only Amazon AWS has a true grasp of infrastructure, and even they will have to think hard about how to make a truly enterprise workload ready and also miniaturize themselves. That is, ship code to tens of thousands of sites to disperse clouds. 
In fact, our dominance in the core is why VMware avoids doing POCs in accounts when we have, are in a head-to-head -head fight. A case in point was a new customer in EMEA in Q1, a major international airport that is one of the busiest in the world. Remember how in the last decade Microsoft Hyper-V wasn't good enough, despite being bundled with Windows, for many erstwhile VMware customers who had profound enterprise-grade needs? With this customer, VMware's good enough wasn't good enough to create a dynamic cloud-grade platform for the majority of their core airport applications. Unlike humans who can work around weaknesses in good, good enough business software, applications cannot work around good enough infrastructure software they run on. Good enough infrastructure is an oxymoron, period. This is why we've been so successful at adding Nutanix core customers. These customers deploy AOS and Prism platform and AHV virtualization to modernize and deliver a cloud-like experience within the walls of their own data center. Nutanix core customers represent the foundation of our business in the near term in our what will enable us to deliver on our goal of at least $3 billion in software and support billings in 2021. In Q1, HV adoption increased to 38% on a rolling four-quarter basis. HV was a decision factor for one of America's leading operators of general acute care hospitals, our second largest deal of the quarter, which is more than $5 million. This healthcare provider will expand deployment of our platform to support its field facilities, all using HV virtualization. Once companies have experienced the simplicity our platform brings to their core infrastructure, they often quickly and enthusiastically want to graduate and standardize the Nutanix across their IT infrastructure, developing pure play software-defined cloud platforms for their business-critical workloads. These companies are Nutanix Essentials customers, Essentials with a capital E, who build on our core offering to deliver on security, automation, data management and operational efficiencies. They do so with Calm for app-centric orchestration, Flow for application security, Files for storage consolidation, and Prism Pro for large-scale operations management. What might not be obvious is that Essentials runs on top of Core. That is, Essentials pulls Core with it in all deployments. Case in point on this leverage and crawl before you walk philosophy is one of our U.S. federal customers, a department within the U.S. Navy. They are more than $2 million in lifetime bookings with Nutanix and made their first purchase with us in 2016 for VDI. Over the following few quarters, they expanded to server workloads in the data center and started replacement of legacy three-tier and remote offices, all with AHV as the hypervisor. Late in their journey, they purchased licenses for Calm, and in Q1, they expanded the Nutanix deployment even further, leveraging our platform across even more remote offices with the addition of both Flow and Prism Pro. Another example of this customer journey is a $1.5 million deal with a U.S. government agency that provides fact-based, nonpartisan information to Congress. This customer, which has lifetime bookings of more than $4 million, first experienced Nutanix core almost four years ago. Since then, they've materially expanded the use of our platform, utilizing AHV, managing their unstructured data needs with files, running all their enterprise applications, virtualizing their exchange environment, and finally in this quarter, expanding their VDI environment to 4,000 users. Finally, Nutanix Enterprise, Enterprise with a capital E, customers advance into hybrid and multi-cloud deployments with Carbon with a K, Era, Buckets, Volumes and Xi Cloud Services, our new suite of SaaS-based services. This new suite includes Xi Leap for disaster recovery as a service, Xi IoT for edge cloud computing, Frame for cloud native desktop as a service, Beam for multi-cloud governance, and Epoch for multi-cloud application observability and monitoring. Most Xi services use Nutanix core and essentials, yet others make them better by being multi-cloud thus making our stack compete better with other clouds. There's no Xi without core and essentials. I repeat, there's no Xi without core and essentials. Or all core and essentials products currently running on-prem will become part of the Xi catalog. And that is what every computing company on the face of this planet covets, a catalog that can run both on-prem and off-prem. This leverage in the customer journey of crawl, walk, run is evident by how our end users adopt our solutions. 
in Q1, 19% of all our deals involved one or more for essential or enterprise solutions in addition to our core offering calculated on a rolling four-quarter basis. We're confident those customers who realize the simplicity and reliability of our core will continue to recognize the value for extended platform and continue the journey with us seamlessly. We've talked a lot about Xi over the past few quarters, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm pleased to say that Xi Leap is now generally available with future geographies rolling out over time. Going beyond that, Xi IoT, our edge computing solution, is also generally available, and we have made significant updates to our frame desktop as a service offering, adding role-based access control in the cloud. Our customers have already validated this, that there is demand for this set of services in the market. In the last couple of weeks, we closed a deal with a public school district serving over 5,000 students to use Xileap. We made DR invisible for them. They do not need a backup and recovery box on-prem. DR is a huge adjacency for us and will also become a highly automated way for us to migrate workloads off-prem with one click. In this quarter, we worked with the Google Cloud team to win a deal with an American worldwide consumer products company in the Global 50, our first with this customer, to deliver Frame virtual desktops to their workforce. The customer has invested in Frame alongside G Suite, a natural partnership for worker productivity in the cloud-first world. I'd like to highlight another win worth more than a million dollars with a life insurance company in India. They've decided to move forward not only as a core customer with AHV virtualization, but to rapidly graduate to both Essentials and Enterprise with Prism Pro, Calm, Flow, and Xi Epoch. Our message this week to .next is clear. Xi Cloud Services from Nutanix are now open for business. As many of you know, we made a very successful transition to software over the past year. Recently, we've evolved our business model toward an increasingly subscription model designed to deliver more recurring and predictable revenue. This quarter, we saw 51% of billings from subscriptions, up 20 points from 31% just a year ago. We are in a very good trajectory with this transition. Dustin will get into our expectations for how this will play out in just a minute. To summarize, over the past year and even today, we have significantly added to the breadth of our platform broadening our capabilities to address the challenges our customers tackle as they modernize their ID infrastructure and expand into multi-cloud operations. This product velocity stands as a critical advantage for Nutanix. Today, we introduce a simple way to understand our product offerings based on how our end users adopt Nutanix. This is about a customer journey, a buyer's journey, a seller's journey, a learner's journey, from infrastructure modernization with Nutanix Core to a customer cloud platform with Nutanix Essentials all the way to the use of multiple cloud platforms with Nutanix Enterprise. In the journey to at least a $3 billion billings in FY21, three large workloads of markets will lay on top of Nutanix Core. Unstructured data, which is files and objects, structured data, which is databases, and desktops, apart from virtualization and containers. To conclude in Q1, we had a strong quarter with notable progress in our evolution towards subscription software, strong product innovation with many new introductions including Xi Cloud Services, and continued strong growth in our business. Now, I'll turn it over to Dustin to review the financial highlights of the quarter. Dustin? Thank you, Dirich. Before we uh, get into the review of our, our Q1 fiscal 19 results, uh, which for revenue, operating loss, earnings per share and earnings per share exceeded both our guidance and consensus estimates, I'd like to provide some historical background on how we started to monetize our software and how we built and will continue to build on this foundation to ultimately move to a fully recurring subscription business model. The first monetization of our software and the initiation of our recurring subscription business actually began when we first started shipping appliances in late 2011, early 2012. With customers engaging in subscription-based software and support, uh, software and support entitlement contracts, basically recognizing the value of receiving continued software enhancements on an ongoing basis. In 2014 and 2015, we began selling standalone software, including software and support entitlements, to our OEM partners, Dell and Lenovo, and have since added Fujitsu and IBM. 
In 2015 and 2016, we started to separately sell software upsells or additions on top of our base operating system, such as Pro, Ultimate, and later Prism Pro. It was also in late 2016 and 2017 when we first offered our software through a subscription offering to run on HP and Cisco servers. During 2017, we began software-only subscription sales of our operating system, which afforded customers the ability to run our software on the server platform of their choice. And it was in 2018 that we started another monetization vehicle for our software, software-based sales of our software, subscription-based sales of our software on Dell XC Core and Lenovo XC Core products. Along the way, we also began selling subscription-based uh, sales of additional software offerings such as Calm, Flow, Files, and more recently, SaaS-based offerings such as Beam, Frame, and now Xileap. So as you can see, our move to software has been planned and executed from day one and has progressed significantly over a several-year period. And our move to a fully recurring subscription business model will take a similar path thoughtfully planned and executed over an extended period of time. As we discussed in our last uh, earnings call, the move to a fully recurring business model will involve changes to how our software solutions will be packaged for our historically non-portable software sales. We stated that we would begin a phased-in approach that will, trans that will transition our non-portable software sales to a recurring subscription licensing model. We further stated that this would replace today's licensing structure, which is based on the life of device, giving customers greater choice and flexibility around their software procurement strategies and provide portability of the software. We also discussed that we would implement this change beginning in Q2-19 and ramping through the second half of fiscal year. I'm pleased to announce that we had a bit of an early start with this transition. And in Q1, we transacted over 110 customers on this new licensing methodology. These transactions included enterprise, commercial, and SMB customers, new and existing customers, as well as a good mix of customers from all geographies. Although we're off to a promising start with our shift to a fully recurring software business model, like our shift away from hardware, we're not naive regarding the work that still needs to be done with both back office systems and front office education to make this a complete this transaction transition a complete success. As you might expect, we have bold plans with this shift to a fully recurring software model. In FY17, our subscription business accounted for 31% of our billings. In FY18, our subscription business accounted for 41% of billings. And in Q119, the subscription business accounted for 51% of billings. In Q1 alone, our new term-based licensing accounted for over 20 million in bookings. We believe that in the next four to six quarters, our recurring subscription business will reach 70 to 75% of total billings. And by FY21, we expect a large majority of the business should be recurring in nature either on-prem or cloud-based. In our view, this continued shift to recurring subscription business model, combined with retention rates averaging 90% and an average contract duration period of 3.6 years, demonstrates increased visibility and predictability into our model as the company moves away from life-of-device licenses. We will uh, provide further thoughts on how we envision the progression of a recurring subscription business model during our investor day, which would take place March 20th in New York. Now moving on to a few Q1 highlights, revenue for the first quarter was 313 million, growing 14% from a year ago and up 3% from the previous quarter, ahead of our guidance of 295 to 310 million. This performance excludes approximately $104 million in pass-through hardware eliminated in the quarter. Software and support revenue was $281 million in Q1, up 44% from the year-ago quarter, and up 5% from the prior quarter. Total billings were $384 million in the quarter, representing a 22% increase from the year-ago quarter and a 3% decrease from Q4. 
software and support billings were $351 million, growing 50% from the year-ago quarter and decreasing 2% from the prior quarter. On a billings basis, pass-through hardware represented 8% of total billings. This is slightly higher than what we expected and is mostly related to geographic mix and timing of orders. The bill to revenue ratio in Q1 was 1.22, slightly lower than the projected 1.26, reflecting a small change in product mix. Our Q1 deferred revenue increased by 71 million in Q4, uh, up uh, 571 million from Q4, up 72% from a year ago, and up 11% from the previous quarter, ending the quarter at 702 million. New customer bookings represented 24% of total bookings in the quarter, down from 29% in Q118. We had a record number of customers booking deals greater than 1 million in the quarter. Customers with bookings greater than 500,000 represented almost 50% of bookings in the quarter. We had a strong Global 2000 performance in Q1 with G2K software and support booking, equaling 31% of the company's total software and support bookings in Q1 up from 28% in Q4-18 and 26% in Q1-18. In Q1, our software and support bookings from our international regions were 40% of the company's total software and support bookings, up from 36% in Q1-18. Our non-GAAP gross margins uh, grew in Q1 to 78.6%, up from 61.9% in the year-ago quarter and 77.7% in the prior quarter. Operating expenses were $272 million versus our guidance range of $280 to $290 million. Fewer headcount additions accounted for most of the shortfall. On a non-GAAP basis, on a non-GAAP net loss was $24 million for the quarter or a loss of $0.13 cents per share. A uh, few balance sheet highlights. We closed the quarter with cash and short-term investments of $965 million. That was up from $934 million in Q4. Uh, DSOs on a straight average was 69 days, an improvement of nine days from last quarter. Uh, the weighted average DSO was 24 days in Q1. We generated uh, 50 million of cash flow from operations in Q1, which was negatively impacted by 13 million of ESPP outflow. And we generated positive 20 million in free cash flow during the quarter. This performance was also negatively impacted by the 13 million of ESPP outflow in the quarter. Now, turning to guidance for the second quarter, on a non-GAAP basis, we expect the following for Q2. Billings between 410 and 420 million. Revenue between 325 and 335 million. Gross margin between 78 and 79 percent. Operating expenses between 300 and 310 million. And a per share loss of approximately 25 cents using average shares outstanding of 180 million. I'll just wrap up with a, a few final comments now. We are now at a point where the Billings hardware pass-through mix will bounce around in any given quarter at a somewhat immaterial rate between a low of 5% or less and a high of 10%. Again, with most of this variability related to geographic mix and timing of orders. We expect this to continue for the foreseeable future. Regardless of the actual rate in any given quarter, we would still expect gross margins to remain in the high 70s. And we will, of course, continue to provide the actual hardware percentage each quarter. Additionally, as I mentioned before, we have bought about at a steady state range with a percent of a percentage of pass-through hardware that we experience in any given quarter. Therefore, beginning in Q2, the quarterly decline in year-over-year -year growth in total buildings in total revenue that we've experienced during our transition away from pass-through hardware is expected to moderate and growth will eventually reaccelerate as we go forward. And with that, operator, uh, if you could please uh, open a call up for questions, that'd be great. Thank you. To ask a question, please press star one on your telephone keypad. The first question comes from the line of Matt Hedberg of RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead, your line is open. Um, hey guys, thanks for taking my question. Uh, congrats on the on the strong results here. Um, 
D. Rich, I'm wondering, can you give us a bit more color on the crawl, walk, run message for core essentials and enterprise? And is the right way to think about this as a software bundle, um, or is it still sort of like a la carte uh, within these different tiers? Yeah, thank you, Matt, uh, and uh, thanks for the question. Uh, so we, as I mentioned, you know, we look at this as a journey for the customer, a journey for our seller, a journey for our channel seller, and a journey for anybody who's getting enabled on selling and uh, and uh, really uh, you know, furthering our products. So in that sense, we're not using this as a price bundle. We're not using this as a way to say, look, you will go and buy something uh, based on a certain uh, price book or SKUs assigned to core essentials of the enterprise. What's really important is people to uh, realize that Essentials uses core and Enterprise uses Essentials and core. So there is a progressive utilization of the products and these are not disparate products. They're not like completely misaligned with each other. Even Frame, for example, which is a SaaS-based service, very soon in the next uh, couple of quarters, will go and use on-prem Nutanix, including off-prem Xi. So if you think about it, a lot of these service offerings uh, will actually start to use both on-prem core and essentials and off-prem core and essentials running in Xi as well. So I think the idea here was to basically go and, and educate and enable our customers and our sellers to realize that there's a progressive way to get to what these new offerings in the SaaS world are. That, that's helpful. And then, and then maybe a follow-up for Dustin. Uh, you eliminated 104 million of pass-through hardware revenue. I think you said that was about 8%. Um, I'm curious, going into the quarter, what were the expectations uh, for Q1? Just, I just wanted to get a, a sense for the delta, um, you know, in that mix. Yeah, I think it's. Um, I don't have the exact calculation, but it's probably uh, somewhere around uh, maybe 5% or 5 million differential, somewhere around there. Maybe a little bit more, but somewhere in that ballpark. Got it. Thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. Your next question comes from the line of Aaron Rakers of Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Yeah, thanks uh, for taking the questions, and also congratulations on the quarter. I, I, just as we kind of think about the transition that you guys are now ex executing through, I'm curious if there's a, a way for us to frame how much of your subscription revenue growth is at this point being driven by, you know, the transition of your existing customer base from the portable, or I'm sorry, the non-portable software revenue relative to the monetization effects of some of the additional offerings, be it Flow, Beam, you know, et cetera. I'm just kind of curious of how we think about the mix within that subscription revenue between those items. I think the – lion's share of this transition is going to come from the core and how people consume the core uh, because we were all node-based licensing, if you remember, for the last five, six, seven years. And now we're moving to a capacity-based method, which uh, is basically tone-based. And the fact that it's portable is what makes us, uh, you know, use it for subscription as opposed to life of device. Uh, so I would say that uh, it's early to say that uh, I mean, anything with uh, the enterprise, SaaS, or Xi Cloud services adding to the mix, most of it's really coming from core and essentials. Okay. And then as a, a real quick follow-up, I'm just curious, as you guys, you know, make this, this kind of pivot in the strategy, you know, how do you think about the competitive landscape? And I think, importantly, the competitive landscape evolving you know, looking out over the next 12 to 24 months? Who, you know, has there been any change currently, and, and who do you view as actually your your most formidable competitors going forward? Yeah, so uh, in terms of uh, the competitive landscape, nothing has changed, um, you know, in the last quarter or so. It's still a lot of on-prem, three-tier hardware vendors who used to sell blade chassis and fiber channel switches and storage arrays. So you go and collapse all that with the software-defined infrastructure. And, uh, you know, we see enough of VMware, but we don't see enough of VMware. And about 70% of the transactions or, or POCs are not uh, seeing VMware, VMware. Uh, and we are going after very high-end workloads as well. And the other accounts where we see, do see VMware, I think we are going with head-to-head -head fights. We are going with uh, – I, I mentioned this in my script as well. 
you know, we really want uh, to go after POC's proof of concepts uh, with VMware. We've built some highly automated testing tools, uh, and uh, we really believe that customers are looking for the same high quality that they were expecting from these three-tier hardware deployments to come from a software-defined infrastructure. As I mentioned, I think uh, nothing has changed in that respect in the last year itself. Now, uh, Dell EMC definitely is closer to VMware than it was, let's say, a year or two ago. But even there, we have navigated the, you know, cooperation waters really well. You know, we've moved to Dell XC Core products, uh, and XC Core is basically meeting the channel where we actually use a certified uh, Dell hardware. So in many which ways, you know, we're driving our own brand and our own pull from the customers, and many of these things are coming directly from the customers that they want to transform themselves. They are looking at subscription-based pricing uh, because OPEX is good for them as they look towards cloud uh, consumption and such. So I, I think in that sense, the next 18, 24 months is going to be a lot of VMware, a lot of three-tier. Uh, maybe you see a little bit of Azure stack, if at all, uh, if, if you see any Azure stack. And uh, over the course of uh, the next uh, six quarters, maybe some Azure as well. Very good. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Alex Kurtz of KeyBank. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Thanks, guys. Uh, a question and then a clarification. So, Daraj, on, on the transition to subscription, can you just remind us how the sales organization, as well as the channel, uh, will be sort of the, the quotas and the compensation models will, will change, if at all, uh, as we go through this over the next 24 months? What what should we expect and see from the outside when we when we hear about this transition and what it means to quarterly execution? Sure. Yeah, so I'm going to chime in, and Dustin, you should also add to this. So right now, uh, in terms of what we're collecting and, and, and what we're uh, even seeing from the customers, they do want to see three-year deals and five-year deals and such. So uh, I expect that some of this will be driven by the market forces. Right now, our comp has not changed because uh, the three-year – sort of uh, subscription uh, collection is pretty similar to what we're doing with Life of Device. Uh, now, as we go and uh, really look at uh, the lower and the mid-market, uh, where there might be some price pressure, we might start to do uh, a few more one-year deals, but it's very early to say anything regarding that. And maybe that market will be driven more by inside sales. So there could be a new uh, compensation strategy for inside sales and uh, the territory managers, the commercial account managers who don't deal with enterprise or, or, or global accounts themselves. Uh, and did you have a second question, a second part of the question? Well, well that just uh, that's helpful. Thank you. And then just a clarification around one of your supply, one of your hardware uh, partners has been in the news in the last couple of months, and I was just wondering if you guys could take a chance to explain what you've seen from your side, um, any potential disruption around that hardware partner, and if it really matters at all as you look into uh, the rest of the, the quarter and, and the fiscal year. Yeah, uh, Dustin, and then I'll let uh, Deerich chime in as needed here. Yeah, we've, we've been pretty upfront about this. that We were notified back, I think, in March uh, of this through the same reporter, actually. And we, at that time, did a thorough investigation, found nothing, uh, took it very seriously, uh, and then this latest round, we did the same thing, you know, worked with Supermicro again, uh, took it seriously, found nothing. Um, and, you know, relative to the quarter, uh, there were some questions and things like that, but there was no impact to the quarter uh, really at all from this issue. And I think the important thing to remember here is that, you know, our software runs on seven different server platforms. Uh, so if anybody did have an issue, they've got uh, effectively six other choices uh, seamless choices, if you will, uh, to go run this uh, our software on. So no impact for the quarter, uh, and we found no issues uh, whatsoever uh, with uh, with uh, those allegations. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Your next question comes from the line of Wamsey Mohan of Bank of America Merrill Lynch. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I was wondering if you can just comment on. Uh, how you view the potential opportunity for, for multi-cloud management in, in view of sort of the IBM Red Hat uh, deal announcement? And I have a follow-up for Dustin. Sure. Uh, thanks, Wamsi. Um, 
So it's early days. Uh, the multi-cloud word is a buzzword, um, just like cloud was a buzzword maybe three years ago and continues to be a buzzword today. Um, the way at least we look at it is that there will be a need for a new, and I'm going to use a metaphor, a hypervisor, a virtualization stack on top of multiple clouds. Just like there was a need for virtualization or a hypervisor across multiple servers and across multiple storage boxes on-prem. So we put a layer of uh, software that virtualized servers and storage equipment and we got to do the same across multiple uh, cloud stacks themselves. And in that we have built uh, a few mechanisms. In fact, we'll announce a few of them tomorrow around migration and drag and drop from one st uh, cloud to another, on-prem to off-prem disaster recovery seamlessly with one click. So migration becomes a killer app for multi-cloud. Just like it was a killer app for within the on-prem world, the killer app for VMware was vMotion and storage vMotion and DRS and HA and all these were just about moving the app when it failed, when it was hotly contended in a, in a high load environment and, and when it needed to move from an old box to a new box. VMware became a very large company because of building seamless mobility across different hardware boxes. And that's what's required across multiple clouds itself. And that's how you commoditize anything. You, know, you commoditize anything by virtualizing it. You virtualize something by bringing portability of applications in a one-click seamless fashion. So if you think of this uh, portfolio of products that we have in the multi-cloud world, they are either a policy engine that tells you what is wrong, like maybe because of cost or because of governance or security or compliance reasons, and then how do you correct and rectify it, which is where you need to invoke a mechanism for migrating it from one cloud to another. So both the mechanisms and the policies will form the new quote-unquote hypervisor in a multi-cloud world. So it's a very early days to say exactly what will happen, but what I can tell you is that uh, what is needed in that is a lot of uh, migration uh, mechanisms around storage and networking and security and identity because you have to move an entire app from one cloud stack to another and it uh, takes a lot of doing. So as a company, we've done a really good job of data, data migration, whether it's replication or disaster recovery and runbook automation and things of that nature. But now I think the bar will be raised with security and firewalls and networks and things like that. So how IBM Red Hat navigate that, it's, it's early. I mean, at some level, I think as IBM puts its arms around the open stack stack, I think uh, clarity will actually emerge. Okay, thanks, George. And, and Dustin, just a quick one for you. Uh, appreciate the incremental revenue breakout that you guys gave. Uh, I was just wondering if, in just some qualitative terms, you could you could talk about how much of that subscription mix is currently term-based versus SaaS versus uh, support entitlements. Any any directional color there uh, would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, well, of course, right now there's very little uh, SaaS in there, as you would expect. Uh, that will build up over time. And uh, I don't have the exact, we can get it for you, I don't have the exact uh, split there on the subscription pieces there. You know, there's multiple uh, pieces there with support, um, but we can get that. You've got it almost uh, from the prior uh, breakouts that we've done there, um, but we'll, we'll get that to you. Okay, thanks, Russell. Your next question comes from the line of Katie Huberty of Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Thank you. Question for Diraj first. You mentioned that, that hybrid multi-cloud is, is becoming a buzzword, and we've certainly heard it from just about every infrastructure hardware software company this quarter. So curious how you think it, it impacts your business. Are you seeing your pipeline growing, customers coming to you because competitors are affirming your strategy? Do, do your salespeople have to spend more time, you know, explaining the difference between your strategy and, and some of the others, just how this evolves as, as more players uh, follow your lead? Yeah, thanks, Katie. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, we definitely go and talk from the position of our strength as opposed to a position of someone else's strength. And uh, many of the customers, we go and talk about uh, their adjacency and our adjacency. Their adjacency is on-prem right now, and our adjacency is on-prem, which is software-defined de infrastructure. Uh, and then we go talk about uh, disaster recovery as a service. Like, hey, how about the first uh, uh, 
uh, crawl piece of this multi-cloud uh, journey where we can do one-click failover and testing and fail back and things like that. Now, all of a sudden, the app is mobile because we did all the hard work with uh, runbook automation and shipping data and things like that. So we basically start with our adjacencies. And then uh, there's some of these multi-cloud services that are very adjacent to Nutanix, like desktops is very adjacent to what we have really understood and embraced in the last seven, eight years. We probably are one of the strongest uh, companies to understand end-user computing experiences across Citrix and VMware and now with uh, Frame itself. And now people are asking about Frame uh, to be extremely multi-cloud, you know, use my AWS credits, use my Azure credits. I talked about one of our experiences with uh, co-selling with Google uh, G Suite itself. So I think uh, we are going and navigating this multi-cloud buzzword around our adjacencies so we don't talk fluff, I think, because most of the money is still coming from compute and storage and networking and security and some of these workloads around that, like files, uh, like databases, like desktops. So I think we ask our sellers and uh, to actually go and focus on workloads because workloads and applications is where most journeys actually begin. Understood. And, and Dustin, software and, and support billings came down a, a bit this quarter. Is that just new seasonality as the business scales, or was there some impact of the subscription transition in the quarter? If so, how much? Yeah, no, there really wasn't uh, any impact to say on the subscription piece. Actually, you know, when you look at this, the length of uh, uh, these new licenses, the 20 million, uh, it's, you know, it's a slightly higher than the 3.6 average. So there really wasn't, uh, you know, any any tilt to one year or anything like that in that. But, uh, you know, we had, in, in just looking and dressing billings in total, uh, we had uh, um, guided billings down uh, actually in, in Q1. We came off a really strong Q3, a really strong Q4 into a seasonally soft uh, Q1 so that, you know, we had guided 370 to 390 million of uh, of, uh, of, of total billings, and obviously we came in at uh, roughly 384 or so, so uh, close to the top end of that range. So it was kind of as expected there, and the pieces kind of fell out as they did. Okay, thank you. Congrats on the quarter. Your next question comes from the line of Jack Andrews of Needham. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Well, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. Um, you know, Diraj, it looks like to me you're achieving um, the highest growth rates with customers that are spending the most dollars with you. You talked about the 111% year-over-year growth in customer spending, more than $5 million. So I was wondering if you could drill down on what's what's happening with these larger dollar amounts in particular. I mean, what's what's really driving that, and do you view kind of these large what these larger dollar amount activities as uh, leading indicators for the rest of your customer base? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, what you're seeing is the first phase of what we talked about as segmentation almost 18 months ago um, in around uh, February of 2018, 2017. Uh, we talked about segmentation. So in that first phase of segmentation of our sales force, we moved up market, and uh, that creates a lot of opportunity for cross-sales, up-sales, more workloads, expanding workloads, and, and, that's, and in fact, we have shown that through our repeat business numbers that have actually grown across our customer base itself. Now the next phase of the uh, segmentation will be around inside sales and you know, how do we really go about uh, these uh, you know, mid-market uh, customers, lower and mid-market customers themselves. And you'll see that happen in the next uh, 12 months itself. I think we, we've settled down on the, on the upper half of the pyramid. Now we're going for the middle of the pyramid uh, in some sense with channel investments and inside sales investments and such. So uh, I think it's a barbell strategy for us. You know, one end of the barbell is large customers. The other end of the barbell is a frictionless transaction, transactional business. And uh, we expect to actually go and, and figure that out, uh, you know, in the coming uh, uh, quarters and, and beyond. Thanks. And then just as a follow-up, could you maybe uh, frame what your customer base looks like uh, today in terms of, you know, mapping it to the core essentials and enterprise uh, layout that you um, introduced, you know, what it looks like today and, and how you see that trending over time? 
Yeah, in fact, we started, uh, we introduced a new KPI in our infographic, and, and I, I spoke about it uh, as well. And in fact, it's going to be in the investor deck too. 19% uh, of all our deals that have one or more products beyond Nutanix Core. So obviously everybody has Nutanix Core, um, except for maybe one or two customers that are not using uh, Nutanix Core because they're frame customers that are using desktop as a service uh, in AWS or Azure. But other than that, it's uh, all Nutanix Core customers. And we'll start to report on this on a, a you know, quarterly, uh, rolling four quarter basis going forward. And maybe it's someday we'll actually even say how many of our customers have both core and essentials, how many of our customers have core essentials in enterprise as well, as these numbers start to really come together. Great. Well, thanks, and congratulations on the results. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Eric Suppinger of JMP. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Yeah, thanks for taking the question. A um, couple things. One, on the um, enterprise and essentials uh, ratio, what, what kind of um, contribution? Uh, if 19% if of deals uh, include uh, products from those, those uh, product categories, how are revenues going to track to that uh, longer term? Do you, do you envision that customers that are buying multiple products would, would the core product, would the, would the uh, core, would the essentials and enterprise products eventually eclipse the core component of those customers? Or how can that rate, how can that revenue contribution uh, look if you look out a few years? Yeah. The good thing about the nomenclature is that it's timeless. Uh, over time, more things will actually fall into essentials, and then some things will fall from essentials to core itself. Because, you know, as technology matures, you know, some things become essentials, and then other things that were essentials now become core itself. So we expect that uh, we'll start to bolster more of the core. I mean, some things might even fall off the core because everybody knows that that's really needed anyway. So might not even talk about for example, let's say PRISM being part of the core because PRISM is assumed to be part of the core. Uh, similarly, AHV might become part of the core and then over time if we really start doing 80% of everything with AHV, you might say, look, why even talk about it actually? You know, so I think the whole idea of this nomenclature is that over time things will move from en enterprise to essentials and from essentials to core. But the customers start to experience the journey from core, especially the new customers who never heard of Nutanix before, and there's quite a few out there. I mean, today when you look, when you look at just America's global 12,000, you know, we've barely scratched the surface. We have only 15% penetration in America's global 12,000. So we have another 85% of the customers who need to go through the experience of Nutanix core, then the essentials, then the enterprise. Uh, on the AHV piece, it's been, uh, it's been on a pretty good trajectory. I think it increased about 3% over the past quarter. When does that start to reach a, a maturing level? Uh, when are we going to see that, that contribution of AHV customers uh, uh, basically stabilize? Uh, you know, you just saw me talk about uh, the global 12,000 Americas alone, and we're only 15% penetrated there. So there's a lot of new customers, and uh, I think there's basically a three-layered cake there, which is, you know, the global 500 and the global 2,000, the global 5,000. And they all have different kinds of uh, needs. I mean, many folks in the Global 5000, they're looking at VMware as the new Oracle. Like, you know, there's a lot of predatorial practices around licensing and auditing and things of that nature happening. But people are saying, look, uh, I, I really want to look at virtualization as a commodity, actually. You know, it, it doesn't really belong in, like, multi-million dollar sort of uh, you know, expense and things like that. And uh, then there are other customers who love VMware, and then yet other customers who are actually uh, completely, uh, I would say, neutral to what the virtualization stack itself looks like. So we are going to see a lot of uh, progression in this over the coming two, three years. I don't expect this to actually, uh, you know, materially stabilize at least for the next two years. And obviously all of Xi is AHV, so think about our, our, our cloud offering. What we're using in Xi is all AHV, and the best part is that without being too self-righteous, we're saying, look, we'll actually support uh, mixed-mode customers where the on-prem that they're running is, is VMware, and the off-prem could be AHV. And that's what customers really like about us, that we don't go and shove AHV down their throat. We're saying, look, if you're happy with VMware, 
stay with it because we can still go and sell a lot of data services, and network services, and uh, compute services on top of it, actually. Very good. Thank you. Your next question comes from Jason Adder of William Blair. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Yeah, thanks, guys. Um, I guess the first question is just on the macro environment. If you could uh, provide some commentary on what you're seeing out there, whether you've seen any changes given some of the um, kind of political fluctuations. And then the second question um, is kind of on this uh, multi-cloud hypervisor vision for UDRAJ. Um, as you think about what you need, the pieces that you need to get there, um, I, I would think Kubernetes is, is pretty critical just because it's being seen as, in a lot of ways, um, the key kind of common denominator across clouds. So any comment uh, would be appreciated on um, what your plans are for um, you know, Kubernetes development. Yeah, just on the, the macro, uh, Jason, yeah, we uh, always, you know, are looking at it and, um, uh, you know, making sure that we're not missing anything, but clearly uh, we haven't, uh, you know, we haven't seen um, any slowdown uh, in our business anyway. Now, you know, we're not, uh, you know, a, a $20 billion company that would have, you know, insights into everything, but certainly, you know, within our uh, realm anyway, we've seen uh, really no signs of that. Obviously, we look at it all the time. I know a lot of companies are having issues one way or another with currency. Uh, we're fortunate to be selling, obviously, in U.S. dollars and things like that. So, uh, you know, we've got that reasonably covered from that perspective. But uh, we continue to look at it and continue to monitor it and, and, uh, and be aware of it. But there's nothing right now. Uh, that we see that's impacting the business. Uh, yeah, and, and yeah, I mean, we have levers to make adjustments uh, as needed and people versus programs, things of that nature. And uh, obviously, nobody has a crystal ball around this. You know, this is going to be a black swan event whether we like it or not. And uh, I think the people versus programs levers piece is an important piece of uh, our strategy going forward. As we see anything really uh, dampening with the macro, I think we'll have ways and means to go adjust accordingly, actually. And uh, talking about your uh, Kubernetes uh, comment, definitely Kubernetes makes uh, compute very mobile and portable. But then there's everything else around it that really needs to be made portable as well, which is storage and networks and identity and security. And I mean, there's a ton of pieces around uh, NetSec and, and storage that need to be portable as well. And I think it's... Uh, one of the core advantages of Nutanix is that we really understand data, uh, data migration, replication, uh, you know, backups, things of that nature. Plus, we understand networks now. For the last couple of years, we've focused so much on networks, around networks and security. I mean, Xi would not have been possible without really digging deeper into multi-tenant networks. Like, what does it mean to really move an entire uh, primary site from on-prem to off-prem without changing even a single IP address is a very hard problem that we've had to go solve for. Uh, so a lot of the network virtualization pieces that have come together in Xi uh, make us, uh, you know, really competitive in the space of portability of applications. But Kubernetes alone doesn't make an application portable because there's a lot more to an application state than just sitting on the server itself, which is basically just software. Uh, that software needs storage. That software needs other services like object storage clusters and files st file storage clusters and uh, you know uh, active directory and and vlan settings and load balancers and firewall settings all those things have to move around before you call kubernetes to be the end all and be all of migration and, and just on the kubernetes and on the compute side for you guys is that something that you support today kubernetes oh absolutely in fact we have uh, gotten really deep into kubernetes over the last 12, 18 months, uh, you know, this is one of the biggest advantages of uh, our architecture that all our code now runs as containers, all our code. And uh, that has been a big issue with uh, many of the companies that actually run uh, inside the kernel, inside the hypervisor. You can go and, you know, really infuse the value of containers inside the kernel of a hypervisor because it actually was written 15, 18 years ago, you know, and they didn't think about services, they didn't think about uh, you know, uh, patch upgrades, uh, hot upgrades, 
uh, rebootless upgrades, uh, many of the things that Kubernetes actually makes possible, uh, we've been able to do in our own software. And now people can run Kubernetes containers on top of Nutanix. So one thing that we actually really went on the path of saying, look, no change to the open APIs and CLI of Kubernetes. Unlike Pivotal and Red Hat, who actually added wrapper stuff around it, we're going and saying whatever open source is is what we'll actually go and support. So things like kubectl and all the APIs are exactly the same. And in fact, even on COM, which is uh, the orchestration layer that we have, we're saying the app specification of Kubernetes is a subset of COM's app specification. So you can take an, a very well-formed uh, uh, Kubernetes spec and put it inside COM, and now you have a hybrid app, you know, which uh, is both a co combination of containers and uh, virtual machines, actually, which is probably going to be one of the hardest things that uh, IT will struggle with is now my entire app is not containerized. I have things that are running as containers within an app, and I have other things like database tiers that are running on virtual machines. So how do you really go and make a hybrid application possible? How do you make it auto-scalable? How do you upgrade it? How do you migrate it? And all these verbs of an app, which is backup, replicate, uh, scale out, upgrade, migrate, all these verbs in the app are now possible with Nutanix in a very hybrid setup, which is both a combination of containers and VMs. And that's where the money will be. Thank you. Know, IT ops, uh, you know, we have to go and talk to IT ops in a way that is uh, mundane, but it is still uh, pragmatic and realistic about the transition to containers because overnight we're not expecting every uh, piece of the app to become containerized. Great. This concludes today's conference call as we've completed the allotted time for questions. Thank you for your participation.